today. Hopefully finish out the chapter here. Today is Palm Sunday, so uh, just so happens we happen to be in a passage of scripture that's between Palm Sunday and uh, crucifixion, so that's uh, that's good good timing. We designed it that way. So uh, I'm going to start in Mark chapter number twelve. I'm not going to read the scripture yet. Uh, I would like to just kind of give like a chronological outline of uh, some of the things that happened here at the end of Mark. So, of course, we know uh, Jesus, when he was on earth, his ministry lasted three and a half years. And if you're not reading the Bible, I, I, I hate to say it this way, I'm not trying to preach this morning. If you're not reading the Bible like you ought to, <laughs> uh, we're real good about, well, we'll take this one passage of Scripture and read it ever so often. But it'll really help your personal studies if you just read the Bible through. If you read that the entire book of Mark through, because you'll see, even though the Lord's ministry was three and a half years, I mean, the last five, six chapters here in Mark, they happen within a week. And I mean, it's just, it really help your uh, perception, I should say, if you just read that thing through a couple good times, you know. Uh, but we start here. Uh, we see in Mark chapter number 11, don't turn there, but in Mark chapter number 11, these last several events of Mark happen quick, just right within a few, da right within a few days there. You had in Mark chapter number 11, the triumphal entry. Okay, that's what we... If you want to say celebrate, well, I don't know that we celebrate, but we do acknowledge Palm Sunday. Uh, and it's the fact that on the Sunday before the resurrection, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Okay, so we had the triumphal entry take place in Mark chapter number 11. And of course, you know the next thing to happen, that's the cleansing of the temple. He sees what's taking place in the temple and he goes in and runs those rascals out of there. And he turns over uh, the tables of the money changers. The next thing you have after that, remember uh, I taught on a couple weeks ago, those Pharisees questioned his authority. Uh, they said, by what authority do you do these things? In other words, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, and they were mad that Jesus had messed up their business. And what they considered undermining their authority, but if they only realized who they were talking to, they wouldn't have thought those things. The next thing that happened, and uh, this is what Bill taught on last week, you got questions from the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and the scribes. Uh, if you'll notice there in Mark chapter number 12, after the parable of the vineyard, uh, you see... Uh, in verse number 13 of chapter number 12, it said, And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians, quote, to catch him in his words. That's what they were out to do. Uh, they were out to catch Jesus in his words. But praise the Lord, nobody could ever catch Jesus and trip him up in his words. Uh, you'll find a pattern set throughout Scripture that every time they ask this man, of course we know he's the God-man, he's God manifested in the flesh, every time they asked him a question, he had an answer. So much so that it stumped them every time. He had an answer. But notice that when Jesus asked them a question, they couldn't answer. Amen. If you want a, a picture and a good type of what the great white throne judgment's going to be like one of these days, the final judgment on uh, a bunch of lost people that rejected Christ. Uh, all these atheists today, they can get smart and witty and come up with their little arguments. Well, if God is real, why does this happen? Or if God is real, what about this? Or why did God do that? Or why would He drown the whole world like He did? And this, that, and the other. They can ask those questions. I promise you the Lord's going to have an answer for them Amen. then. And then when he asks them a few questions, there they're, they're going to stand no representative. Amen. Nobody on their side because they've rejected. 
They rejected the one that tried to save them. Amen. They're not going to have any kind of answer. They, they, they may be some answers, but I, I believe the Bible says, and uh, this is over in Romans, that the whole world may be guilty before God and that every mouth may be stopped. Uh, the one of the well, the greatest day of my life is when I shut my mouth and listened to the Holy Ghost that I was a lost sinner on the way to hell, and that Jesus Christ died for my sins. He was buried and rose from the dead. Uh, my mouth shut up. You can make a lot of excuses, and you hear a lot of sinners. That's what they want to do: is make excuses and this argument and that argument. If you just listen, <laughs> just open your ears and listen. Uh, and be receptive to the Holy Ghost. Uh, he'll, he'll show you what you are. And that's a sinner in need of salvation. But praise the Lord for that. They never could trip him up in his words. But notice in, in verse number 13, the Pharisees and Herodians came. That's when they asked him about the tribute money. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes? Jesus answered them. Uh, the next, it said in verse 18, Then come unto him the Sadducees which say there is no resurrection, and they asked him. So isn't that funny? These men that didn't believe in a resurrection came and asked him a question about the resurrection when they didn't believe it to start with, and he still outsmarted them and stumped them and gave them an answer that they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, that they didn't know what to do with. So Herodians and Pharisees, then came the Sadducees, and then the last question uh, that Bill went over there, it said, and one of the scribes came. And that's the one who asked him the question about what are the, what's the greatest commandment. And Jesus told him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And he said, The second is, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the goal of these Pharisees was to catch Jesus. And like I said, praise the Lord, they couldn't do it. So once you have the questions from the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and scribes, uh, the next thing that happens, and it's not really hit on in Mark too much. Um, Mark hits a couple verses of it, but if you really want to read it, and I would encourage you to read it this week, uh, go read Matthew chapter number 23, the whole chapter. The whole chapter, and it fits right in this time frame right here. Jesus is absolutely, uh, for lack of a better word, roasting the Pharisees alive. I mean, he's pronouncing woe on them in everything that they're doing and everything that they are, and he spends a whole chapter dedicated to that. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've, I've heard some people, well, I don't like that mean preacher or, you know, them old hellfire and brimstone preachers. Jesus Christ was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. Uh, they wouldn't like Jesus Christ's message either because the things he was saying to the Pharisees, they, they weren't nice, okay? He was saying a lot of stuff about what they are, and it was all the truth. Um, but that's in Matthew chapter number 23. He spends a whole chapter pronouncing woe upon the Pharisees. And then, of course, you know the next thing that happens, and uh, I'm sure Bill will get into next week. Possibly, well, next week's Easter, maybe not. But uh, the next chapter here in Mark, you have the Olivet Discourse, where... After that, Jesus Christ takes his disciples that go up on the Mount of Olives. And uh, the parallel passage would be Matthew chapter number 24. And he talks about what things are going to take place at his second coming, you know, and the end of the world uh, as we know it. So he spends a whole chapter dedicated to that, uh, as well as really chapter number 25. Um, so you have the Olivet Discourse. Next thing you have is the Last Supper. We're all familiar with that. Uh, right after that, you have the Garden of Gethsemane. And then after that, you have the arrest and trial of Jesus, followed by the crucifixion, uh, which we believe to be on Wednesday. So Sunday, they're welcoming, welcoming him in, into Jerusalem, saying, Hosanna, you know, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. By Wednesday, they're, they're killing him. So you can see how quick, you can really see where their heart was and how quick people can turn on you. Uh, but, I mean, just, just three days difference. Uh, we, we don't, uh, I'm not going to get into it in the timeline. We don't believe in Good Friday. Uh, that's a Catholic tradition. Jesus Christ died on, you know, Friday afternoon, rose on Sunday morning. 
Uh, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter number 12 that the only sign given to this generation would be the sign of the prophet Jonas or Jonah. He said, I'm going to, the Son of Man is going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. It's hard to fit three days and three nights between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning. It's not possible. So I, I went to North Buncombe, but my math, you know, it, it's just hard to squeeze all that in there. So, uh, and of course, we know uh, three days later after the crucifixion, he rose from the dead. So just to give a, a timeline there, how quick these things happen. Uh, if you know, like I said, it, it really helped me to put things into a timeline and a perspective. Uh, a difference in between chapters. Just pay attention to, you know, how much time is in between. It. it I, I can't explain to you how that helps, but it really does help and put things into perspective for you. So, what I'm going to start here, and I'm not trying to reteach or do anything that Bill did, but just given that. Uh, chronological order I'm not going to hit everything but I would like to since it is Palm Sunday I would like to hit a little bit uh, on that so we notice what Jesus does uh, he has let's see chapter number 11 he tells his disciples to go get him a donkey uh, now we know why he did this and let me actually read here in Matthew chapter number 21 it gives the reference So let's see. The reason they did that, it said, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. So this was written in Scripture. If they had been looking, don't you know that was the strangest thing? This man comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. They, they probably thought, well, that, that doesn't make any sense, you know. If they, <laughs> if them Pharisees and all them people had have been reading their Bible and known what that meant and what that represented, uh, it says, let's see, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass. Uh, there's a reason for that, not only to fulfill prophecy, not only to show that he was meek and lowly. We know Jesus Christ was never rich, okay? If there's some of these guys today that are some sort of religious leaders that sit on a throne and have people bow down and kiss their feet and kiss their ring and have all these gold and riches, they're, nothing, they're not Christ-like, okay? Uh, that's, how, <laughs> that's how you get know it's a cult when... I'm getting way off here. When you know something's a cult, it fulfills all of man's desires, you take somebody like Joseph Smith, uh, the guy who founded the Church of Latter-day Saints, they call themselves, or Mormons as we call them. Uh, that man had like 50 wives. I mean, these guys, that's, first of all, I mean, I mean, he was a sex pervert, let's be honest. When he went up to men in his congregation and said, hey, your wife belongs to me, she's my wife now, that kind of person is a pervert. That kind of person is a crazy person. If you're getting rich and fulfilling all these desires of the flesh in the name of God or in the name of Jesus, you're not from God or from Jesus. I mean, it, it doesn't take much spiritual discernment to figure those kind of things out, you know. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting off on that there. But Jesus Christ, he, the Bible says he was rich and became very poor for your sakes. He left heaven. He was born, it, it, they didn't even have a place for him to be born at. He had to be born out in a stable and laid in a manger. And he was poor his whole life. Uh, but notice how meek he was to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, something about that donkey, and I sure don't have time to, to cover all that. A donkey is interesting, and I, you really have a type here of a lost sinner. Jesus Christ saving a lost sinner. So something about this donkey, as far as I can tell and as far as I've read, a donkey is the only animal in the Bible that had to have a sacrifice for it. There is one animal that God demanded. He said, you need to sacrifice a lamb for this animal. 
and it was a donkey. And we read that in uh, Exodus, well, it's twice in Exodus, but Exodus 34, 20. But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. So God said, you need to sacrifice a lamb for that, for that donkey. Uh, what that donkey is, and, and once you start to read it there, it's a beautiful picture of a lost sinner. A donkey's called a beast of burden. Um, but you see here, uh, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereupon never man sat, loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. Praise the Lord that when he came by one day and saved me and redeemed me and cut me loose from the world and from my sins and from Satan and bought me and redeemed me off the auction block of sin, he said, I have need of him. Praise the Lord for that. But a donkey is a type of a sinner. Um, that being said, let's flip over to our text here. Uh, let's see. So Jesus, uh, I mentioned that he was questioned by multiple people multiple times, especially here towards the end. Um, and then Jesus asks a question in Mark chapter number 12. Let's read it. Mark chapter number 12 and verse number 35. Uh, I believe this has been, maybe you don't label it that way, but I, I've, I've heard it labeled the greatest question Jesus ever asked. Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. The Pharisees had all these questions for Jesus, and then he asked them one question, and they blew their mind. This is Jesus Christ destroying the wisdom of the wise. The Bible says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Amen. They could not see or fathom, one, that He was their Messiah, but much less that He was God manifest in the flesh. They had too much pride to believe that. But He shows Him, He, he reveals Himself to the Pharisees in Scripture. He said, who, who do you say that I am? A lot of them would say, well, you're, you're the son of David, you know. Well, you, you came from the line of David. You're the son of David, like you, like you said. He said, well, then why does David call me Lord? And he references the Scripture uh, back in uh, the Psalms. And notice the spelling here. This is talking about two different people, two different persons. Uh, and I, I hit on this a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to talk about the Trinity again. For David said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, The Lord said to my Lord, capital L, lowercase O-R-D. There's a distinction made there. He's talking about sometime in the past, whether in eternity, but he said, The Lord said unto my Lord. There's two. Matter of fact, there's three. Uh, the Holy Ghost ain't mentioned there in the passage. We believe in one God, one, not two, not three, not ten, one God manifests in three persons. Not one God that shapeshifts and switches between them. That's where you get your oneness, Pentecostalism, and some of these other stuff from. We don't believe in that. One God, three persons. You say, I don't understand that. I teach that because that's what the Scriptures teach us. Okay? That's what is revealed in Scripture. One God, three.
three persons. They're all God. They don't make up pieces of God and together. God. They're all co-equal, co-eternal, co-powerful, whatever you want to say. They're all God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We read that in 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, capital W, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. One God, three persons. You say, well, that's hard to understand. Well, something we've got to realize, we're a bunch of three-dimensional creatures, and you're trying to fit a fourth-dimensional creature in your 10-pound brain, and it, you're not really able to do so. If I could understand everything about God and how God does everything and how He literally spoke and made the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, all that, He wouldn't be God if I could figure it out with my little finite brain. But the reason we believe in the Trinity or the Godhead is the fact that that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. So if there's something in the Bible that I don't completely understand, you know what I don't do? I don't change the words. I don't correct it. I don't go out and listen to some Greek professor or some Catholic priest or something of that nature. I take it by faith that what the Bible says it means. Amen. Crazy concept, I know. To believe Every word is pure. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We believe in the Trinity. And that is a reference to God the Father and God the Son having a conversation back in the Old Testament. And David, I'm sure, didn't even know why he wrote it. It said he wrote it by the Holy Ghost. He's just pushing the pen, but God's doing the writing. God's the author. But that's an amazing thing, and boy. It, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say the Pharisees had any kind of response to that. As a matter of fact, uh, you read it in verse number 34, but over in Matthew it, it puts it a little later. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. They were done with the questions after that. Uh, I mean... <laughs> It's just, you know, it, it, it's trying to beat a dead horse. Uh, the, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Uh, they knew they couldn't do anything. That's why they wanted to kill him. Uh, but they knew they had been stumped. Uh, let me reference a couple other places here of the Trinity in the Old Testament because the Jews don't get this. And there's all kinds of cults out there and people out there that don't understand this. But once you understand what the Trinity is, you see it all throughout the Scripture, right. even in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, you see it in Genesis chapter number 1. Right. Genesis 1, verse number 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let us, plural, make man in our image and likeness. Ain't that something? Amen. There's not a Jewish rabbi on earth today that can answer, that they have no answer for it. I mean, the fact that uh, we read in, in John chapter number 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in, a, in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Then you, then you see, the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. He came unto His own, the Jews, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You know who Jesus Christ is. Uh, Paul said, and uh, again this is in 1 Timothy, the mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh. Another place, Genesis chapter number 11 and verse 7, the Tower of Babel. He says, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. He said, let us. He's, it's right there in Genesis. He's referring to himself in the plural. Now, we know that Jesus Christ said this, I and my Father are one. So once again, we don't worship three gods or, or different gods. They're one God. Three person. She said, it's hard to understand. Okay, take it by faith. That's what the scripture teaches. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. 
one God, three persons. Trinity is throughout the Bible and throughout uh, the Old Testament. But that is the last time that Jesus, uh, they, could, they, they questioned him, questioned him, questioned him, and then he asked him a question, can't answer it. So we see, uh, not, not here, but we do see um, over in Matthew, and I, I'm cross-referencing a lot. I know we're teaching in Mark, but uh, sometimes it helps if there's a little bit full passage. Um, you see that Jesus, after he's done pronouncing woe upon the Pharisees, uh, you know he stands up there and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that, you know, how often... I would have gathered you under my wings like a hen gathereth her chick, and ye would not. Uh, there's about 10,000 reasons why I'm not a Calvinist, and I'm not, I'm not teaching on Calvinism today. Uh, but this idea that, well, God, it's according to his good pleasure and his good will who gets saved and who doesn't. God's will is that none should perish. None. None. Is, is that... Do you need a dictionary for that one, or does none mean none? He said, I would have gathered you. His will was to get them for them to accept him. I would have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks on her wings, and ye would not. He puts the blame at their feet. Nobody, one of these days, is going to stand before God at the judgment and say, well, it's because, Lord, you, you just you know, wouldn't save me or do this and that. The blame's going to be at their feet. No man goes to hell because, you know, whatever. a man goes to hell of his own free will. Uh, and, I, 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 again, I'm not getting into Calvinism, all this other stuff. Listen, I believe God is sovereign, but sovereign's not even in your King James Bible. That word's not in it. It doesn't exist. You know what is in your Bible? Free will. About 20 times, the expression free will. I believe God's in control, but this idea that God... Well, he'll, he only wants to save, you know, about 1% of humanity and the rest he just, he don't, he don't care for. That's not the case. Uh, just read the Bible through. Uh, there's too many places that disagree with this determinism, Calvinism, and all this stuff. Thank God I'm not a Calvinist. I'm a Bible believer. One God, three persons, and notice... One, and I keep saying notice, but I'm reading it from here because I'm cross-referencing. One of the last things Jesus says to that crowd, you'll see me henceforth no more until you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And if you'll notice, a lot of the people had already said that. When he came into Jerusalem in that triumphal entry, they were saying that, literally. That's what they said. Um... I don't know if it's here in Mark, but I know it's in Matthew, uh, where they said, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But you'll see here in verse number 37, and the common people heard him gladly. Not the Pharisees, not the religious leaders. So if you want a great practical truth from that, a nation is only as good as its religious leaders. Not its politicians, not its kings, and not even the common people. But what is going on in churches will determine the shape of a nation. Amen. I promise you that. Amen. The religious leaders, and as far off as they had erred and everything they did, like I said, it wasn't three days later that all those people that said, you know, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, they turned on Jesus because of the religious leaders. So, even though they had already said that, Jesus said, you're going to say it again now. That hadn't happened yet, but it's going to. Amen. When the Lord comes back, he's going to land, you know, there on the Mount of Olives. He's going to stomp on about 200 million troops, and he's going to go into Jerusalem. And those Jews have, to, to, to put it this way, those Jews have hated Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. They're not just reject; they hate Jesus Christ currently. Romans chapter number 11, they says the, the, the way that you treated you, they are enemies of the gospel, but they're beloved for the Father's sakes. They're a beloved enemy. 
They are going to be saved one day, the nation of Israel. Okay, we believe that. But as of right now, no, they're in complete blindness and darkness. Right now, as it is, they hate Jesus Christ. But when they get put through what they're going to get put through during the tribulation, you better believe that when they see Jesus, and when he comes this time, he's not going to be on a donkey. And he's not going to be coming with meekness and, and humility and all that. He's going to come on a white horse with armies behind him. Amen. Okay? And we're the armies. Amen. All right? And we're not the ones doing the fighting. He's the one doing the fighting. And uh, I've taught on this before. If you know the story, he's coming from the east. You still have that ancient big giant eastern gate over there in Jerusalem. You know what the Muslims did about 500 years ago? They cemented that thing shut. Nobody's been through that eastern gate. They cemented it shut. They said, if whatever, whoever come back, nobody's going through this gate. And what else they did, they took and they uh, made a big graveyard there right in front of the gate of a bunch of Muslim graves. Amen. And, you know, people aren't going to like this. Uh, they said, well, you know, if we put these graves there, if Jesus, you know, he's some kind of respectable person, he's not going to stomp all over them graves. He's going to stomp all over them graves. Amen. And that thing cemented shut. He's going to walk right through that thing. I, I guarantee it. So they're, they're not going to stop his second coming. But when he, comes, he, when he came as the first time, he, call, he came as the Lamb of God. When he comes as the second time, he's coming to the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he comes the second time, I promise you, Rome or anybody, they ain't going to put no nails in his hands that time. He's coming to set up and rule with a rod of iron, and we, we get to rule and reign with him. Praise the Lord. But there is coming a day when those Jews will say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're going to take the wrong one. They're going to think that the Antichrist is their Messiah. Because right now the Jews till this day are waiting on their Messiah to show up. When the Antichrist shows up and creates a peace, they're going to say, Hey, that's him. Uh, but that's not the case. They're going to realize, well, we, we took the wrong one. But the common people heard him gladly. It's just those no good religious leaders and Pharisees that didn't. I'm going to read here uh, this last part. This is a change up from what I was just teaching, but I, I do still want to go verse by verse and finish the chapter. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. So he spends three verses there talking about scribes and Pharisees, but if you go to Matthew, he spends a whole chapter. So... Uh, Bill's talked about the differences in the books. Uh, Matthew's a little more detailed. Mark just kind of hits the headlines. But uh, they're both inspired. They're just difference of perspective. Verse number 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Amen. So notice how the Lord sees things. Uh, how man sees things is a little bit different. Uh, there's a big church not too far from here, uh, right down the road. I, I don't need to name any names, but there's a big church where, and this is coming from somebody who is a member there. I'm not a member there. I, I know a guy who's a member there. Uh, but he said, you know, when they built this big giant church, I, I call them mini mega churches because they, they hold four or 5,000, something of that nature. He said when they built a new building, they took all the biggest donors and marched them in one by one to recognize them and clap and, you know, just recognition. Uh, that's the case. They have their reward. They want it to be seen of men. But the way the Lord looks at it, that woman, that widow woman, 
who all she put in was two mites. He said she gave more than those rich people did because she gave all that she had. I don't, I don't believe in this, this kind of, I'm all for, you know, okay, if you want to recognize people and people that helped out, I, I'm, I'm not against that. When it comes to money, when it comes to giving, uh, you better be careful the way you see things because some people, they might give $20, but if that's a bigger percentage than the rich guy's given, they've given more. But the, but the story here is that she gave all that she had. Um, another thing uh, to consider, uh, one of my good friends, he's a preacher, and he told this story recently. He said, when I grew up in church and the kind of church I went to, he said, the way they made it sound, and uh, he, he said basically the way they made it sound was that God was some kind of mob boss. And if he didn't get every dime from you that he wanted, your house burned down, you, you flip your car going down the road, and, you know, something like that. But the, but the Bible says, and the New Testament says, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. I mean, it, 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 you ought not to give because you're scared of, you know, hey, they're going to burn my house down, or, you know, I'm going to have a heart attack tomorrow. You ought to give because you love the Lord. You ought to give because you love the church and you want to keep the lights on and the pastor fed. And something special happens at this place. God has given us something and it does cost money to upkeep. And something else, you know, an old preacher said, you know, if bringing up money kills a service, go ahead and throw dirt on it. It was dead to begin with. Uh, but there ought to be no problem with a Christian that loves the Lord to be able to give money to the church. And we ought to be a cheerful giver. And you ought to give what you can give. And you ought to give not to be seen of men, and not to let people know how much you give, not to get your name on a pew, you know, hey, so-and-so donated this pew. But you ought to do that because you love the Lord and want to see the church thrive and flourish because it does take, you know, money. Sometimes we're so spiritual, well, you know, I'll, I'm real good at praying and this. But well, sometimes it takes money, okay? It takes some it takes some things. We need some people to cook some food for some meals and things that we do. Uh, a lot of times, people use this spiritual stuff as a cop out for, you know, doing what God's asked us to do. Uh, but anyway, I I don't even know how to wrap that up. I'm trying to think of something smart to say. I don't have anything else to say. Praise the Lord. It's good to be saved. Uh, Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he rose from the dead. I'm glad I'm saved. Thank you.